Hi there, and welcome back to episode four, chapter four of Ecclesiastes. I feel like as we begin this chapter today, I need to put in maybe a little bit of a warning. You may remember from chapter one uh, that we saw that the words of the teacher were like goads, and we discovered that a goad was a sharp pointy stick uh, that a shepherd would use to keep the sheep or the cows in line. It's like a modern day cattle prod. Well, Sometimes wise words can feel a bit like a cattle prod. They can give you a poke and a shot and they can be uncomfortable and even painful. But they're good for us. They keep us on track. Well, personally, I feel like chapter four, there's some hard words here. There are upsetting words in chapter four. Uh, I'll let you decide for yourself. But I hope by the end of it, we'll see that there's also great value here. And even though some of them are hard to read and and hard to even accept at times. But these are words given to us by God through the teacher, and they're for our good. So let's jump right in and see what we have. In chapter 4, what you've got is another exploration by the teacher. He looks around the world, life under the sun, and he isolates four things that he sees that really sum up how Sinful human nature has distorted God's good order. Not just distorted God's order, but also made it hard for us to see that order. We look around and we throw up our hands in despair. We say, meaningless, meaningless. Is everything surely meaningless? And yet he's going to talk us through four of these things that he finds particularly troubling. I think you'll find them troubling too. And he's going to remind us that in living in this, this world, life under the sun, that, there, that, the, that our human sinfulness brings frustration and trouble as we try to make sense of the world. So let's have a look and, and see what he comes up with. In the opening, you've got verses 4, 1 to 3. He's talking here about injustice. He says, I, to- I saw the tears of the oppressed and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors. Well, we've seen that time and time again, haven't we? It's an ancient story. It's just as true today. And I declare, he says, that the dead who have already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never yet even been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. Sure, that's pretty grim. But what he's saying here is that the pain in this world The suffering of injustice can be so acute, can be so hard to bear. You'd be better off if you'd never experienced it at all, even if you haven't yet been born. That's how bad it is. That's how bad it gets. And at times, that is the sorrow and the burden we carry as we live life under the sun. I told you it gets pretty real, pretty raw. Well, let's read on and see what else he's seen. Verse 4, verse 4 through to verse 6. He's talking about competition. He says, I saw that all toil and all achievement springs from one person's envy of another. And this too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. It's really interesting here, the competition that... We so often stoke amongst each other. The achievement that we so often clamour for often comes, it's motivated by the worst part of ourselves. It's, it's our envy of one another that so often drives the achievement that people crave. People even give you a pat on the back for it. But the teacher says, don't be fooled. It's driven by often the worst parts of ourselves. He says in verse 5, fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. So he says, look, being lazy isn't the answer. Simply sitting back and saying, well, say la vie, what will be will be. I'll just sit here and mind my own business and do nothing. He says, that's not the answer either. Don't be lazy. But at verse 6, better one handful with tranquility then two handfuls with toil and a chasing after the wind. He says, don't be lazy, but listen, he says, 
Don't burn your bridges. Don't dirty your conscience in the quest for achievement as you compete against each other and are driven on by envy of other people. Better one handful with tranquility. Better to have peace and have less than get it all and burn your bridges and live with a compromised conscience and tread on the heads of those that you once called friends. Competition, it's meaningless. It's empty, it's heavy, it's destructive. And it's also part of the symptom of living in this sinful, broken world. We pick it up again in verse 7 through this time to verse 12. This section, he examines loneliness. So we've had injustice, we've had competition. Now we get a story of loneliness. Verses 8. Uh, Verse 8, rather. It's a heartbreaking tale. It's a little mini story right here in verse 8. There was a man. We're introduced to a, a new character. There was a man. He was all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, though. And yet, even though he worked his fingers to the bone, his eyes were not content with his wealth. Why? Well, he says, for whom am I toiling? Why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. He got rich, but he had no friends, no family. He worked so hard all his life for nothing. And he was left desperately alone. It's a terrible story. But you know why it's so terrible? Because it's so true and it's so real. And you might have seen it, you might have seen it in yourself. So in verse 9, the teacher says, well, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, the other one can help them up. But pity the one who falls down and has no one to help him up. He's saying, do you know what? Relationships are worth more than money. They're worth more than achievement and competition. Relationships are the currency that make you rich. And if you've got everything else in the world but you're lonely, you're a poor man, you're a poor woman, and you've got nothing. Now there's a famous verse here in verse 12. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Now, it's a famous verse. You often hear it at weddings. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. The husband, the wife, uh, and God himself makes a wonderful marriage. And that's absolutely true. It's a good verse to use at a wedding. As you can see here now, as we've worked through chapter four, it's not actually a verse that was initially intended to talk marriage at all. It works well for marriage. But what he's saying far more broadly is there is... Mutual benefit in good relationships. If you've got a friend, if you've got a partner, if there's two and not one, that's good. If there's three of you, that's even better. <laughs> right? Friends are the currency you want to be rich in. That's what makes you strong. That's what helps you stand amidst the injustice and the, the competition and the envy and even those days where you feel lonely yourself. Well, let's have a look at the last part of the chapter, verses 13 through to 16. He's investigated injustice, competition, loneliness, and now self-improvement. I'm not going to read it in full, but what we get in verses 13 to 16 is a rags to riches story. It's a story of a young man who succeeds and becomes the king. And there's something noble in it because it's better to be wise and young than to be an old and foolish king. And that self-improvement story, that rags to riches story is admirable. It's good. We see that. We go, yeah, there's something right about that. That's the way the world should be. You don't want an old foolish king. Wisdom sometimes comes with age. But it doesn't always come with age, does it? You can be young and wise, just as much as you can be young and foolish. 
But when you find a wise young person and they get to that place of leadership and they are a blessing to others and they bring good things into that space that they're able to lead, then you sit back and go, yeah, this is the way that life should be. This is good. And the teacher is acknowledging that. But have a look what happens at the very end of this rags to riches story. Verse 16. But those who came later, they were not pleased with the successor of the king. This too is meaningless. A chasing after the wind. So even if you get the right person in the right job at the right time and you sit back and say, yeah, now this makes sense. This is the order I expect to see in life. Even then, it's not always going to work. People are not going to always support the right person. They're not going to back the right horse. They're fickle. They want what they want. They won't always choose what's best for others. So even if you have a wise young person who deserves the position that they have, they won't always be supported. And that means that the order that you think you've just manage to grasp will slip through your fingers just as easily so you see here we have these four burdensome parts of life injustice competition loneliness and that self-improvement rags to riches story it seems like the odd one out because we think it's so good and positive and yet at the end the teacher reminds us that even though it seems to take us in the right direction and it seems to give some shape and order to life under the sun it's going to disappoint and very rarely does it deliver on what it promises now what do we do with chapter four well as i said at the start it's a goad Right? It's that sharpened stick. It's that cattle prod. It's unsettling because it doesn't resolve. It doesn't say, hey, but don't worry. God still loves you. <laughs> now, God does love you. <laughs> but the teacher doesn't remind us of that here because he wants us to, to focus on something else. I don't think chapter 4 must leave us depressed and full of despair. It's not the end of the story. We've got to keep reading through the book. We've got to keep reading through the Bible. But I think what chapter 4 can do for us, I think it helps us to understand why life is the way it is under the sun. I think it helps us to engage with the cry of meaningless, that things are empty, that the order isn't the way it should be. Now that's, that's really hard and it's hurtful and some of us have suffered under these things in a very personal way. But after the grief and the lament and the pain, there is a time to sit back and say, this is what this world is like. It's broken. Human sin distorts God's good order. And at times so much that I can't even see what the right thing should be. Now that's not a solution that makes things better, but it is an answer that helps us to gain the perspective we need to live in this world. Don't be a naive Christian. Don't be a foolish person who has such unrealistic expectations of life under the sun that at the first sign of injustice or unfair competition or loneliness or a rags to riches story that goes south, don't be the kind of person who throws up their hands and say, where is God? This is so unfair. Well, of course it's unfair, and God's right there in it. But this chapter helps us to better understand the world in which we live so that we will have the right expectations of what it is to live life under the sun. Don't overreact. Don't underreact. This is a chapter of of the realism of faith. And I hope it's been a help for you today. Well, join with us again next time. Episode 5, Chapter 5. Read ahead, get ready. I look forward to seeing you again then. Bye.